Okay, I am here with the Barlow brothers. Hello. We have Nathan Barlow and Carrie Barlow. And I am saying you guys are kind of the unicorns of the music industry. Although I just realized, Carrie, your wife sort of falls in this category too. You guys are siblings who are not working together, but having a lot of success in the music industry on your own accord, which is, I feel like, very rare. Yeah, I think so. You I don't know? know? Many people that are doing that. I don't either, except for I walked in and I realized Carrie's wife, Hillary, and, and her sister are kind of doing that. Yeah. Taylor, yeah. Because she's a hit songwriter and then Taylor runs Sony, basically. Yeah. Right. So that's weird that you married that. So maybe like you got unicorns are attracted to unicorns. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> you know? Okay, so I'm gonna start off with a little rapid fire. Okay. Uh -oh. Tell me the first word that comes to mind. Oh God. Superpower. Pizza. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beer. Uh, flying. You want to fly? Yeah. Ooh. Um. Oh man, that's true. Superpower. Um, rapid fire. Yeah, oh yeah, rapid fire. Back. Um, breathe underwater. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, bliss. My child. Ooh. We have two new dads in the house. Oh man, no, I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> um. When do you right. feel bliss? I'll I'll say um, on an island somewhere. <laughs> do you have one in mind? We love Turks and Caicos. Oh, I'm dying to go there. That's yeah, one of my favorites. Know, yeah, not, I know. I mean, yeah, I, would know nothing about <laughs> I mean, send us a postcard, Carrie. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's his life. <laughs> I was gonna see the family thing, but I'm like, all right, I got now. Gotta do something completely yeah. left. <laughs> Shallow. Yeah. Shallow. Hey, you mean? But you probably can make a baby on Turks and Caicos. Too. Uh, you, you can make several babies. Yeah. There. <laughs> so then you get what brings you bliss. Yeah. So exactly. It all works see. <laughs> See? And a lot of people get married down there. Oh, See? It's out. a sweet, yeah. romantic place. Totally. <laughs> okay. Stress. Oh, gosh. Oh, traffic. Nashville traffic is getting out of control. Oh, right? that is traffic. a... Man, you're answering great. Terrible. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, airports. Ugh. I and, agree. I used to think airports were awesome, and they are because of what they do for you, but once you have to travel in them all the time, yeah. security... Oh, no, security. So security, man. Yeah, that's awful. Totally. I agree with that. Do you guys travel all the time on planes? Trains? Oh, well, he does way more than me I now. I travel nonstop. We do, though. I mean, considering we're not artists, we still just travel, yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, you guys got the artist lifestyle mentality. <laughs> okay. Um, vision board. Harry, you go first this time. Oh. Um... Another shallow answer. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I would say more cuts. <laughs> yeah, hits. Yeah, and more hits. Okay, yeah. great. I mean, I'm worse. Mine was like leather jacket. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're like material things. You like you need a new, new, badass new leather boots. Jacket? I do need one right now. Yeah, I'm. I'm in the market for that. But I like that you're keeping your vision board like attainable. You know, like right. you can go buy a leather jacket. And yours is too. That's, that's, for that's him. actually the truth. Like you are like yeah. such a. How great though when that is such an attainable goal. It's like it's a hit well, song. That's true. Yeah. Some some days. <laughs> some days you're like, what did we just do? Some out. This guy. No. I know. Carrie's pooped out quite a few. Yeah. You pooped out some. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. I'm a good poopers. I forgot that you, <laughs> Carrie, you pooped out five number one Christian singles. Yeah. Those are some big turds. Those are. Some but not <laughs> turds. They definitely are. It's good. Turds. <laughs> the, that's crazy. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, that's you know that's where we both we both come from that world and we were preachers' kids and. I didn't really know our preachers' kids. We yeah we were yeah and now that's that's where it all started in the in the church singing and playing and the whole thing. Is faith still at the core of who you guys are? Absolutely not. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, of course. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, I think now, I mean, with us having kids too, I mean, I think it, it only makes your faith that much stronger. stronger. Yeah. I think it just, always like ebbs and flows in life where you're like, you know, I mean, I, I, I think at the core, faith is always there, you know, but, you know, I've definitely had my religion moments of, you know, not really caring that much, but it is true once you have a child, then you're like, I want to raise them how I was raised, and it's a total backwards, you know, going back to the old, you know, I'm like more conservative today than I was like really? two months ago before he was born, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
That's crazy. So your mind really does like flip a switch when you have a kid. They, that is the truth. Uh, yeah. yeah. For me, yeah. Me too, for really? sure. Really? Yeah. Like what, what happens in that switch? I mean, for me, like I keep telling people all the cliche stuff that you hear when people have, it's, there's a reason it's all cliche because that's like the only words in the vocabulary that can describe those. I mean, it is like a light switch gets turned on and you're just like, ah, you know, and like, you just, you stop caring about things that. The selfishness goes away. Or yeah. Not goes away, but a lot less, you know, yeah. like selfishness because. Were you guys ready not to be selfish? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's why like, like, definitely I know, not. I know this is <laughs> hell no. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm secretly still selfish. I just like there's something bigger than me now, you know, and it's just more important. So yeah, you know, the things I want to do or the way I want to spend my money now is a lot different because of him. Like you're gonna buy baby food and baby clothes instead of a leather jacket, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. instead of going on vacation. That's why it's gotta be on my vision board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> diapers. Diapers. Yeah. yeah. I know that's the thing that do, are you guys glad because you guys didn't have kids in your 20s y'all are like older in your 30s like me I'm 33 and before you thought about having kids are you guys glad you had all that time to like pursue your own stuff full force Ab- before absolutely you had kids? yeah yeah I mean I just think just me personally I mean I I wouldn't have been ready at all I mean I was you know like you said the selfish you're, you're doing whatever you want you're going out with your friends you're you know whether it's partying or traveling or playing music or and now it's just like it's the baby's first i mean all your decisions now are you know and not only were we wild and immature but we were chasing this dream so hard that there was blinders on from everything from girls from like like it's if you want to come along fine but there's no one that you could put your whole life into you know and so i i think yeah there's a lot of differences now Okay, so let's start there. Chasing this dream. You guys have been chasing this elusive dream, this in, this con- not country, this music thing that we all who moved to Nashville are chasing after. It's all in our own way. Tell me how it got started, because you guys started in Luna Halo, which is one of my favorite bands, Kings and Queens. I thought was an incredible <laughs> song, and that should have been like number one, top of the charts, <laughs> personally. You guys were like this hot, awesome, cool rock band. Was there a tinge of Christianity? No, by the time I met you guys, there wasn't. Yeah, we started out, we were we were in a record deal, locked in from another band I was in, and then um, when I started Lynn Halo, and then we uh, made one album on that label, and then were released and, and got to do our own thing. So. And by doing your own thing, that means, Carrie, you came in second album, right? Yeah, I I was still in um still in high school and but we we kind of I to, probably my junior year we kind of started talking about um me potentially joining the band if there was Were you like dying to get in there? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, I, I, all I did was play guitar like after school. I mean, before homework, before girls, before hanging out with my friends. It was just like you were play guitar. Yeah, I mean, I was learning their songs and and then actually the guitar player at the time at, right as I was graduating high school, um, had a baby and, and wanted to get off the road. So you're like, and I'm just like, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. I'm like seven, you know, eighteen, freshly eighteen. I'm like, bring it on. Already, yeah. I'd already done all the work for a couple of years, and so. But listen, he's back there in his room practicing. That's like, true. He's, he's yeah. paying his dues. However, he, no, gra- he he graduated yeah. high school. I go to his graduation, pick him up with all his stuff, bring him home. A week later, we're headlining a festival in Holland for twenty five thousand people. His first show. That's so, the way to start, Gary. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've there been... There wasn't a whole lot of uh, dues. <laughs> yeah. He <laughs> definitely first. paved the way. He paved the way, for sure. Like, That's awesome. I just kind of tagged along. Little brother over here. Hey, but you know, I mean, you seize the day. Part yeah, of it's like yeah, Parfait absolutely. Diem, right? Yeah, absolutely did. That's crazy. <laughs> no one wanted it more. Which, you gotta love the um, the drive if someone really wanted to be there. Yeah, and I knew he, he was the right thing, you know. And was that tough, being in a band as brothers? Did, did y'all have brotherly issues? We really didn't. No. What are y'all's personalities like? How do y'all work together? Like, what's the yin and the yang here? Um, I think you're more laid back and and um, kind of assess the situation, and yeah. I'm I don't know. I'm a little it's head first. Everything. Um, I actually have to when we're recording together. But you're older and you're younger. Right. Yeah. So. But also our personalities are. He's much more like. I'm just. I'm louder and more obnoxious for yeah. sure. <laughs> but um. 
the awesome thing is in the studio because he has ADD, his mind is moving a thousand miles an hour, and I have to stop him and be like, okay, go back and play that riff again two riffs ago because that one was awesome. <laughs> I'd be like, I don't remember. So you're taking inventory. So, you're catching it all. Yeah, I mean, I usually. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it works out. So you guys, not only were, after you get with American, is it called American Recordings? Yeah. That's Rick the, Rubin. Rick Rubin produced your album. Yeah, he's so Let's nice. talk about Rick Rubin, because he has done the coolest albums ever. Yeah. So that's a big deal that you guys are still like getting off the ground, and now you have this mega producer coming in. How did that all happen? Uh, someone played in our demo, and uh, I think we had already been signed. We we were signed and dropped four different times. So like, yeah. I think. Well, that. but but the uh, this is a funny story though. Um, the demo that got us the Rick Rubin deal, um, Scott Borchetta went way before Big Machine That's Records. Right. Um, he was working at Dream DreamWorks with um, James Stroud. He got us approved in in the DreamWorks LA office for like thirty grand going into these four demos. So we went in with our buddy Matt Mahaffey, who was in this band called Self out of Murfreesboro, and that's when we did the four songs that, that like he was saying, that Rick heard and, and wanted to, we did a showcase. So. Yeah, so our first thing was actually, or great thing was with Matt Mahaffey from Self, and then we did these demos that got to Rick Rubin. And so Rick just called him. you guys up and was like, I'm in, I love you guys, let's do this? Well, not exactly. We did like <laughs> several nerve-wracking showcases. Dinners and dinners, meetings. You know, so what do you feel like, like at those kind of dinners? Because now you guys are so experienced in all this, but like when you're like kind of still like breaking in, right. how do you feel when you're having dinner with like a powerhouse? Scared to death. Scared. How yeah. did you act? We had to get drunk. drunk. too much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean this because, because, I'm like, you, know, oh, you don't know what else to do. Keep so bringing the bottles of wine, please. Hammered. And yeah. then say yeah. stupid stuff. So. It's really weird. It's so funny. It's normally, <laughs> how it goes. You think, like, the drinking is going to help? You had those, so, you know. I learned I have, I have to put the bottle down. <laughs> I'm not ever any better when I drink. That's <laughs> it does not work in my no, favor. No, sorry. We just, <laughs> that's think we are. Oh, okay, so you have all the, you put your basically courting with Rick Rubin mm -hmm. he says yes you make this album and then what happens to Lou and Halo, Halo because I was shocked when you guys broke up because in my mind I thought this was like going to be the next monster band well, we so were, tell me about that we were doing well we were in movies and you know all over television and had we were the theme song for that show The King of Queens we which were, is ironic because you have a song King of Queens that's why they yeah. did it and we were the theme song you just not getting out of there <laughs> I really like I thought that was just ironic. Hello. Oh my god. Yeah. See? God. Um, but no, we and we toured with Velvet Revolver and um Y'all toured with a lot of people. Who yeah, was saying, is that right? Yeah, Collective um, Soul. Yeah. Um, I, don't worry, I have it written down Need to Breathe, Family Force Five, yeah, Revolve. Yep, all that. You guys so, toured with a lot of people. What was that like? It was awesome. I mean the Velvet Revolver thing sticks out because, you know, um slat I mean it's Guns and Roses guys basically and, and, and Scott, Scott Island so yeah. God rest they, his soul. Slash would watch us from the side of the stage and were you kind of like freaking out oh yeah oh my I mean I remember the first night we were in uh, I think a House of Blues somewhere I don't know no, but uh, I remember setting up my amp I mean you know we didn't have a guitar tech at this point and I'm setting up my amp in front of a wall of Marshall stacks and I'm just like I mean this is a guitar god I mean hero and now you have to go play guitar yeah. for him. And then I have to like, yeah. I but mean, I mean, you're a guitar god in here too, both of you guys. Well. Are. Yes. Not I, all, not I near on that level. We played that night. Yeah. Is that pressure? Yeah. Yeah, and then especially when you look over and they're like, there was a couple nights where they would like, they were watching and we're like, oh my god, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Ooh. It was a cool experience. It was. That's amazing. And we got to hang out with them some, and that was pretty. Pretty wild. That's like a childhood dream because you probably grew up listening to those records and now here you are like opening yeah, them. Yeah, oh my gosh. It's a pinch yourself moment. It's incredible. What is that like, you guys in particular, because y'all both have accomplished a lot. What is that like when you accomplish something you've only dreamed about? Like, how does that feel? It feels, I mean, it's, it's incredible, but I think the thing in us that keeps us doing this is like the drive then just... It, it's like insatiable like it, then you just go to the next you know yeah, I mean yeah. I've learned to really soak it up and enjoy the moment but like literally the next day I let it go and I'm like what next like the next yeah. goal you know so I think that's what has kept us going and yeah. doing what we do and, and I think that goes with whether you're 
performing or in a I mean obviously Anything, playing with yeah. Keith or songwriting for sure you have a successful song I mean I think I think songwriters who have, who have success I, I don't think we celebrate enough you know because know. you don't know when that next one if that next one some people make it look like they're just pooping them out but <laughs> like you well no I mean I wish then you have a party and then you move on and then Monday comes around you have a new write and you're on the, the, yeah the, but, but, you're, but, but even as your song's climbing that chart like you're thinking of, I, okay, I gotta, I gotta go bust my ass because I gotta have another one, you know, and it just never stops. That's why you look at the, you know, I don't have to say the names, but you know, the the writers with twenty and thirty, you know, pushing thirty number ones, they could all hang it up and go lay in the sand somewhere, but you just that drive, like you said, that drive, right. you just, and it's, and I don't, it's not even the money, it's just like it's just inside of you, you know, it's like. You just... You want to keep going. That's, yeah. So did Christian number ones come first for you? The Tony yeah, Mac? Yeah. Talk um, to me so, about how that happened. Well, oh, I, we never talked about the end of Luna Halo. Oh, oh. I want to talk yeah. about how Luna Halo ended because we were... I thought it would last forever and be this amazing <laughs> band. And then I want to hear about how you I mean, we were, well, we, were, we were on the verge. I mean, like you said, not to backtrack, but we made this amazing record um, at Sunset Sound in L.A., where I mean the Rolling Stones, Dixie Chicks. Oh, well, Dixie Chicks were next door making home. No. Wait. Yeah, and so Wait, Rick was Rick. popping back and forth, and did y'all meet him? Um, yeah, yeah. We and, and we worked with, and yeah, we worked oh, with um, a guy named Neil Avron who um, produced the record. He's worked with a bunch of great people, but um, yeah. So, but after that, we did the, the touring, and, and they started surfacing a, um, a, a single to radio. And then Tom Wiley, who was the head of Warner Brothers, it was American and Warner Brothers at the time. Um, so it was partnered with Warner Brothers. Part, yeah, with Rick. And uh, then Rick got hired as the chairman of Columbia at Sony. So that's he when... He there. So he took you out of Sony. Yeah. yeah, so that's when it all started getting a little wonky because... So if you guys would have stayed at Warner... There's no telling. And that's the thing I think people don't realize about the whole record label industry is having the team behind you who loves you, who believes in you, who's been there from the beginning, fighting from it, yeah. fighting for it. If that team changes and all of a sudden you're put up with a new team who maybe isn't quite as like into it, maybe they have their other band they've been working on. Yeah. It's weird how that can really affect can ruin oh my gosh. your career. It can ruin your career. Yeah. And, and that is maddening, right? Yeah. And that's what happened. You know? But it's also funny to think about like one, not a small decision, that's a huge decision, the fact that you know the band if it would have worked out, though, we might not have our children, our lives, our wives, our, our you know, it's just everybody's path and God's plan is so different than than what we all it's hard to have say in that our heads. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Especially when you it's have such a big disappointment like that. Because to me, that would be a big letdown. Yeah, oh, we were so, yeah. I mean, when things started going, like. So you guys like, are at building up. You're at the height of your momentum. Yeah. If he Could he have left you at Warner Brothers? Uh. I don't know. I mean, it was a technical. Like it was crazy. Yeah, they they mean, wanted us to go. I mean, they wanted us to go with them. I mean, that. Yeah. You guys probably wanted to and go we with wanted your guy. to be with Rick, and we wanted to be with our A and R guy, and so you know. But then we got there, and there was a uh, probably a six month hold up or more. Probably nine. With them yeah. Hiring new people and firing. People and then they picked out another single. Picked out a different single that had already gone to Rick. You know, like it was just a bit of a mess. So. And all of a sudden, this perfect At that momentum point, our thing. momentum is yeah. starting to go down. And music and, changes um, so fast. Yeah. And the the especially in, I mean in rock and pop. Oh, I mean even in country. I mean. It, you know, it's just constantly. All right, what's what's the next coolest thing and. and you can be old news. And I'll never Very forget sitting in quick. that office and talking about, oh, we just released our single and blah, blah, And then they're like, here's this new band we just signed, and it's MGMT, and it's like the coolest shit ever. And I was like, oh, uh, we're screwed. And, yeah. they're like, like, and you're like, why are you playing Because we made our yeah. record like two or three years before that, yeah. and it still wasn't out, you know? And, and then we hear like Electric Feel and these yeah, songs and that are like indie and MGMT artsy. Things, and we're, we're like, like oh, You're like, no. we have this. We're like, first. we're dorky now. We're dorky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we became the old weirdo rock and roll <laughs> yeah. guys like fast. But, you it's know. crazy. So how did it fall apart, and how did you deal with that? Um, I think eventually, you know, I mean, you kind of know when something's winding down, whether you're willing to admit it or not, you know, right. and we had been in this band for 10 years and just, you know, it's our family. Everyone in it was family, you know, and I think we could all feel it falling apart. And then, uh, 
I think that one of the first things was when Chris, our drummer, left and joined Kings of Leon as their auxiliary guy. Yeah, he, he's and, ready to go uh, make some money. That was kind yeah. of the first thing that started to unravel the, the core group. Because I don't think he, any of us wanted to give up on each other either. Right. You know, so right. that, that was like the it. hard part. Yeah. Because it wasn't really about the label or anybody else. We didn't care, you know. We just, like, we're doing it for each other at this point. Mm-hmm. And um, as soon as, you know, he left and joined Kings, then... You could see it was time, you know. So oh, how do you deal with that kind of disappointment? It sucked. What do you do? How did y'all work it through sucked. it? I mean, we we like we kept going for a little while. We had um, an old drummer that had been in yeah. the past band um, come back, and, and then uh, uh, Victor and Jonathan Smith um, play. And we played for an, we did a, like another EP and just kind of like we still played some shows and stuff. But, but like the energy and the it wasn't quite the same. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I think we were. We were tired too. And, yeah. You know. It just. Did yeah. you grieve it? Like, did y'all grieve the loss of it, or did you just move yeah. on so fast? No, I didn't play music for a, a long time. Like, like you were just. You I had... didn't do anything for a, a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's like your baby. It's like yeah. losing a child. Honestly. It is. Yeah. Especially because you obviously y'all been doing it since high school. Yeah. And now, yep. like you know, it's been like what? Tw- how long are you in Luna Halo? Total we for like the time. Twelve years total. Twelve yeah, years yeah. total of your life. You know. But after that, like like you're saying earlier, Carrie, everything kind of has silver lining, and now your lives have continued to unfold, mm-hmm. but you guys put your head down and did the work to make yeah. them unfold. That's when you guys kind of went in different directions, I feel like, right. this moment. And then you linked up with Toby Mac, Carrie? Well, at, at the same during yeah, at the same time that um, we were writing our record, Luna Halo, um, he had had a publishing deal with uh, Still Working, which was uh, Barbara Orbison's company, mm-hmm. and I had gotten signed by I was wait Nathan or Toby um, okay. Nathan okay. yeah yeah but um so then I I was like Toby had asked me to come play guitar on his records and, and we had known him just from from years and the DC Talk days and stuff and um. So I was playing on a bunch of Christian records, just playing guitar, and um, then I started writing with them. But I was also in this band that wasn't a, technically a Christian band um, anymore. But um, I just, I just always had a desire to just try to write songs with, for people, and whether that means going in and playing on records, and then it turned into a writing relationship. Or, but uh, he was smart. He offered. I mean, I was twenty, what twenty one when mm-hmm. he offered me my first publishing deal, and I was pretty broke at the time and I'm like yes <laughs> let's do this so while I was there we were still touring and, and me and Nathan were the core writers of Luna Halo but I would always I would write with um, with a lot of Christian artists and I had some success I mean most, five number ones I'd say yeah and that. I mean I, I'm not to be that, that guy but I, and I think it was even more than that I don't oh nice yeah, um, we had yeah. three well, you should be that guy how many number ones I don't know have? I honestly don't even know I mean I've had I think a total with Toby Cuts was probably 13 Oh my gosh. Yeah, and more than half of those were singles and What's the difference between a Christian cut and a country cut cut financially? You don't have to tell me break it down. It's a lot. Yeah. Okay, so country cuts and are more That's yeah. why he's forgotten about all the Christian <laughs> No, I mean You're praying Jesus for them. But. No, I'm i I'm so thankful for it. <laughs> But the money is a little yeah. bit more. Well, you know, I, like I, we've always like loved country. I, I mean, our grandpa loved like old classic country, George Jones and Hank and Williams and Johnny Cash, and we always kind of listen to that stuff. But um, and then, but as where we were coming from, like more pop rock world and how country was evolving and changing, you know, I mean, especially if, you know guys like your husband and Jaron and guys who come from more of that yeah, rock kind scene. Of three, all that. Yeah, this <laughs> was a perfect time for all of us to kind of transition and um and now it's just like a wide open door but um but yeah i mean i i am um, so i i was signed to toby it's called emac um publishing emac music i was there for three years and when those when that third year was up i wanted to kind of challenge myself and just i, I left and i was just like this might be stupid but i'm gonna go up yeah, and down you're your height of your christian career honestly yeah i mean i could have stayed and, and um but I felt like I had the relationships there that I could, I could still hopefully work in that market. Um, but I wanted to go do some new things, you know. And like I said, we were in Luna Halo, but I wanted to, I wanted to challenge myself and, and try to get my foot in the door in the, in the country world. So how did you get into the country world? Um, JD from CSAC, um, Luna Halo. They brought Luna Halo over to CSAC, and I was looking for a publishing deal, and he introduced me to Jesse Frazier. 
and Bob Doyle. And I went in there nervous. I mean, this was Garth Brooks' manager. And I was like, I've written some country-ish songs at that point with some, you know, co-writers and stuff. But actually, the song, they got, I got signed there from, it was from Luna Halo and from Toby stuff that they had heard in the past. And they were like, man, you should write some country stuff, you know, and. So they signed you, and they signed me. Did you start getting hits right away? Because your first no, one was that, that American Honey. That well, that was my first. That was With Lady well. We have a funny story. Our first country cut together was yes. Taylor Taylor Swift. Yeah, cut. which is quite which a way to start. Still the only outside song she's ever recorded. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. And that was called Untouchable. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's another. So Scott Rochette has actually played a big role in you guys. Yeah. Well, still, now still Nathan, does. You're signed to Big Machine Publishing, yeah. so he kind of like. Got you guys hooked up with Rick Rubin? Yeah, he's never left. He's always <laughs> he's just been a fan and a friend. And now he, friend, and then he played and... Taylor Yell's EP, Luna Halo. Yep. Taylor heard Untouchable, and she said, oh, I'm just going to go cut that yeah. Luna Halo song? Yeah. yeah. How did she... that change her life? <laughs> that was, it was amazing. ridiculous. <laughs> How like, many albums had she sold, the one that that, was, was, that song was on? That was oh, uh, 10, 10 million. 10 million, I have yes. a plaque that says Stop. 10 million, and that was like, Ten or eight years ago, so this is probably who knows now. But yeah, you ten million at the time. Ten got, million yeah. albums. So yeah, that's it was, like almost it was impossible. Uh, that doesn't fearless. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh, it's crazy. So okay, so that happened. That was your first cut in country music. Yeah, yeah. Did you have that when you were going to talk to Bob Doyle to get your uh, publishing deal? Well, but I no that but that was published by by Emac by old by Toby's company. Okay. Toby got that. Because and it was a Luna Halo song. I mean, that's the whole thing. That was like we weren't we didn't plan that. That just had that felt. happened though in the world yet? Like yeah, that happened? that had happened early on, and that was like, I mean, you know, that's so you got that good credit. Yeah, that's his great bragging rights. Hey, <laughs> right. we have a Taylor Swift cut. Yeah, like you should uh, sign me. We're Taylor still Swift. using that one. It's well, it's the only yeah. outside song she's ever cut. You yeah. should. Yeah. yeah, it's a big deal. It's good. And she did change it and make her her own and stuff, but uh, pretty crazy. But um, so after after that, you know, I just had a lot of new artists, country cuts, and. But the the biggest thing to happen uh, probably two or three years later, three years later was um, after being signed with Major Bob was the American Honey. You were at American Honey, and is that where you met your wife? We yeah, well probably a year or so before that we met writing. Because yep. you can't yeah. fall in love in the songwriting room. A lot goes down in the songwriting I mean, room. You're, more than just songs. Yeah, <laughs> it does. You're very <laughs> I vulnerable. Do every week. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, like, because you have to expose your heart. Yeah. And here, your wife is Hillary Lindsay. She's written basically every Carrie Underwood song that ever was, and yep. obviously American Honey too. Yep. So y'all were writing together, formed a, a chemistry in a lot of ways. Yeah, and we and we were friends, and at the time we were both seeing other people, and. Um, it just, you know, after those relationships um, ended, we, I, I was, I was pretty hooked. I mean, I mean, pretty early on. You can ask him and lots Harry of other people. Chaser. Yeah, I was, I it was the like chaser. Chased, I was the chaser, but I tried yep. to play it cool and not cross the friend zone. You know, gets oh, a little. Oh, you cannot enter. Fr- Once you enter friend zone, though, it doesn't matter how hard you're chasing your friend. I yeah, understand. yeah, it's weird, but it worked out. So. Okay, so before I get to you, Nathan, yep. I want to wrap up. Tell me your hits that you had in country music. You had Yep, Yep. Is it called Yep, Yep? What, uh, where it's at. Yeah, oh. with Dustin, Dustin Lynch. Lynch. That was his first big song, right? It was. And um, a quick story. Uh, after he signed to Broken Bow, I was like one of his first um, co-writers. So it was weird, like, however many years later, to be, like, on stage getting number one together. That was a That's awesome. crazy feeling. Um, so American Honey was first, then um, Where It's At, and then Sundays. Oh, Florida with, Georgia yeah, Line. Yeah. Billy Carrington. That's, well, that's that's out right that's now. That's out right now? Okay. Yeah. What's that song called? Um, It Don't Hurt Like It Used To. Yeah. Michael came home the other day and said, this new Billy Carrington song is so good. I don't think he knew you wrote it. Crazy. <laughs> he was like, if I got pitched that, I would cut that. Song. It's not number one yet. Fingers it crossed. Be. It we're, will be. We're number three, so crazy. Okay. That's freaking awesome. Crazy. Okay, so that's what you did when Luna Hel- Halo broke mm-hmm. up. And now, Nathan, you say, I'm not done with the band yet. And so you form a new band. Tell me about that. Because yeah. you guys were, that was a cool band. You guys wore a mask and stuff. Yeah. And well, tell me what happened there. Well, actually, like, in between that, I, I we had another thing that I drug Carrie in on called the Honeymoon Thrillers. I remember was, that, too. Yeah. yeah. Good, t- good name. It was what? funny because um, <laughs> I just wrote, I, you know, like I said, I pretty much, like, I was pissed off, stayed away from music for a while. So you were, you were upset. Yeah, I, yeah, it bothered me, you know, because... Um, the fact that business could ruin a band that was as good as we were and for 10 years of hard work and overnight 
because of some business stuff. Like it makes you a little bitter. Yeah. So, As it should have been. I mean, you can't stay there, but I would have been pissed off too. Yeah, and I think I was like more. I was just hurt that it was, you know, that it came down to that. But I mean, I, I was still sort of. It's not like I stopped listening to music, but I just was trying to reassess like what's going on, and um, then I just it was so weird. I just got incredibly inspired by listening to old Beach Boys records again. Really. And yeah, I went upstairs and within. I think it was about eight days had written 12 full songs for this album. How thankful and, were you uh, for that inspiration? It was amazing. Because you probably yeah. hadn't had it in a while, huh? No, I hadn't. Like, how long had it been dry? Uh, had your well been dry? Probably a year. Yeah. So then all of a sudden, Beach Boys came so, to the yeah. They made you feel all They're like... All beachy times. You know? And I thought, like, what if we could do, like, a modern take on 50s music that is, like, um, still a little weird and out there, but, like, um, you know extremely pop and extremely like harmonies and like super Beach Boys style um, so yeah we started the Honeymoon Thrillers which um, immediately kind of got a lot of buzz and attention and it was sort of happening really quickly but it probably just reinvigorated um, you guys too yeah and it felt good too just to get out and play again and not, do something different not really care so much and just yeah. sort of let it happen and um but, you know, it started to get a little too serious too fast. And, you know, um, some of the guys in the band had kids and wives. And, you know, Carrie and I didn't at the time. But um, the touring thing just turned out to be really? it's going to be a problem. You know what I mean? Unless we were making money, which, you know, starting out, you, know, you don't make money. Wow, so. for sure. And yeah. that's a myth that everyone thinks is so glamorous about music. And it's awesome. But it yeah. takes a while to make the dough. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Long while. Long while. So, yeah. As an artist. Yeah. So while that was happening, I was just, I was so inspired and I was doing tons of, uh, like, I was writing every day with other people, but also I, uh, I wrote with this kid that our publishers had set me up with in Franklin. I think he was 20 at the time or 21. His name is uh, Zach Hall. And uh, we wrote this song that I think was like a pop Britney Spears type pitch or something. And then literally after that, he goes, hey, I like this track that you might want to write something over. And he played it for me, and it turned out to be my new band's first single, which was called All Fall Down, which was... Um, and the, tell me that your new band's the name. The band Five Knives. The Five Knives, yeah. and you had a front lead. Uh, he yeah. was in another band, too. Yeah, so Five Knives started um, as That was just, a cool band. As, thanks. It started well, as good. an experimental electronic project. I didn't want us to have our faces shown. I, I wanted it to be like just an art project on the side, not like, not a real thing, not even, you know, and part of that was we would never play real clubs. We would never do it the way anybody else You're would do like, it. You're going to see it. Kind of, yeah, before yeah. she was even out, yeah. you know. And um, so, but then I realized like I'm getting older and it's not cool to be the front guy when you've had four failed record deals, and this, you know. <laughs> so I kind of just thought, you know, it, it would be much more fresh if I found a girl that could front the band and then we would be like the music masterminds behind it. And um, So that came out of an accident when you were doing Honeymoon Thrillers. A hundred percent, So yeah. did Honeymoon Thrillers just kind of go away? Yeah, I mean... And you kind of were already doing your thing. We've never officially broken up, actually. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should have a reunion We might. We might do another EP. We might do another record. <laughs> you um, should. Yeah, we just sort of left it open ended, and everyone was cool because we weren't, you know, we weren't out there like trying to right, make it. Right. You know, yeah, it was, it was like for fun. Like, you right. Know? Yeah, and uh, I wanted it to. I wanted Five Knives to do that as well. I just, I just wanted it to be fun and chill. And but then you are so good, you didn't well, need a record deal. Well, in three shows, uh, like labels. Yeah, were, his like tenth record deal in his la life. Labels are showing up at our third show, and next thing you know, we're at South by, and all hell's breaking. So, um, and y'all signed with Red Bull Records? We signed with Red Bull, the drink company. They had AWOL Nation, and Sale was blowing up at the time. Yeah, and what a great company and, uh, to be with. Yeah. I mean, they're huge. huge. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're just, um, yeah. They, I was going like, to say they're monsters, but then I was like, no, that's monsters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't no, say they're Red Bull. Yeah, they're Red Bull. Yeah, so that happened, and um, and we, uh, you know, our I think our first big tour, we went out with 21 Pilots. Oh, and, uh, hell yeah. New Politics, and... Was that awesome? Did that. Yeah, it was amazing. And then we, were you able to be as inspired in this band as you were in Luna Halo? Were you able to like, or is it a yeah, different kind of? Yeah, in a different of? way. Yeah, it was totally, yeah, you, I mean, 
it's just a different thing. Yeah. I was you having new wisdom too. And I, I knew, yeah, I'm older and have done it before, so I knew what not to do, and you know, mostly. Mm-hmm. You always, you always <laughs> said that you enjoyed not being the lead singer too. And right? I really, yeah, it was the first time I wasn't the front guy. But Nathan, you have a the, heck of a voice, though. Well, I mean, your voice is super insane. Thank you. So it's kind of a, a pity for the rest of us when you're not the lead singer. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, I enjoyed not having the pressure and, you did? and uh, yeah, and and not you know no, I wouldn't do interviews. I wouldn't. Well, at first, then I got suckered into them. But um, you know, that was kind of my plan was to be like in the back, you know. Um, but it, it was fun because it was EDM dance music, but a live band playing it. Mm-hmm. So we got to tour with like Skrillex, but then we'd be with we went out with Smashing Pumpkins on the tour. And, okay. So, you know, and then we'd be at just a normal festival one weekend, and then we'd be at some crazy EDM, like, Electric Daisy Carnival, and, you know, Ultra, and Miami, and, yeah, it was, it was a little, it was insane, so. um, So how, because I feel like there's also, pretty much anything the Barlow's touched, there's always momentum and excitement behind (laughs) I mean, it's really true, both of you guys, so I feel like there's also a lot of momentum and excitement behind that, and then... How did you find yourself transitioning out? Because now you're the Phantom doing this thing called the <laughs> Phantom with Keith Urban. Did you make it up? Yeah. Okay, which you have to break this down because I've never heard anything like this. And I'm sure your past lives have led you to the Phantom. Yes, and that's what I tell people all the time is I wouldn't be in Keith Urban's band without Five Knives. Yeah. And Five Knives was a complete accident. But because of Five Knives... So Five Knives is because of the Honeymoon Thrillers. Yes. Which is because of... Oh, Halo. Halo, yes. so look which at is the because of reality. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so for me, it all, you know, I had to learn, uh, because I was in an electronic band and we were trying to pull it off live in a new way. Uh, well, not in a new way. People like Nine Inch Nails have been doing that kind of thing. But like, we're combining live elements with super, super programmed electronic stuff, but that we're trying to trigger live and play live. Mm-hmm. I had to learn how to do all that, you know? And so, um, and I had to learn how to do it on a broke band's budget in a van with like setting it up myself and figuring it out. So you you're know? kind so, of a genius. No. I mean, to even, figure that out. Not even close. Oh, it's way over my head. <laughs> I don't close. even know how to understand what you're talking about. Well, anyway. Um, so you built this thing. So, yeah. So Five Knives, I, I ended up leaving um, Five Knives at you know, a, a certain point just as I, I kind of was feeling um, like it was time to go. Yeah. And, um, and then this, I got a call. I, I was actually talking to his publisher, Jesse Frazier, one night. Who now and, Jesse's turned into monster yeah, hit songwriter, yeah. producer. Crushing yeah. And, Crazy and, and Jay Z's guy here in Nashville now. He's Jay Z's so, guy? Yeah, he just opened Jay Z's company. I mean, it's crazy how people evolve in this town. It's yeah. amazing. It's nuts. So, yeah, so uh, Jesse and his wife were friends with me and my girlfriend at the time, and we'd go out to eat probably once a week and just hang out and catch up and uh, gossip and be stupid. But um, just fun couples, you know. Yeah. And casually, one night, Jesse's like, the weirdest thing, like, uh, Jerry Flowers from Keith Urban's band called me, and they were looking for a guy that can do programming, uh, live EDM type stuff, but can also play guitar and keyboards and sing, and he's like, yeah, uh, the only guy I know is Nathan Barlow, and he would never do this. <laughs> and I was like, well? dude, you call him back right now. I'm like, like, text him, I want to see you text him back. <laughs> yeah. Like, Nate is interested, like, today. Yeah. So, um, I'll holler. He's like, yeah. really? You would do that? And I'm like, yes. Like, I love Keith Urban. Like, I yeah. certainly would at you least. You couldn't tour the cooler guy. Yeah, I'm like, I'd love to talk to him, you know? So, they uh, flew me out, and I hung out with them for a weekend to kind of see how we got along. And I soon realized that they weren't even exactly sure what they wanted. They so, just, they needed you to create it. They sort of just knew, like... We need a new guy that does that can cover these track parts because they didn't want it on track, and so I was trying to figure out like how, you know, the best way to do that was, and that's when I came up with the Phantom, which is um, quickly just like four iPads and another controller that run through Ableton Live, and I cut up. I spent a month cutting up Keith's record into perfect little samples and putting each on a button. So like. I play, I play it like a keyboard, but it's, instead of me recreating, like if he has a keyboard sound on his record, instead of me trying to match it and remake it and whatever, you just put um, his actual I put record. the actual record on these things. So you have uh, perfect sound. cuts 
And you have to be in perfect and time. Perfect timing. That's, yeah. Yeah. Like you can't. And remember where you put it because each song, when you fast forward to the next song, all twenty buttons do something totally different. So how long do you have to study? Oh, I rehearsed by myself for like a month, and then the band rehearsed for a month before we went out. So what did so Keith I Urban played. say the first time you've all you're all practiced up? The Phantom is ready and built. You're in your first rehearsal with Keith, and now you're gonna display to him this creation. How did he? What happened? <laughs> well, the funny story about that is Keith never heard it. He saw it first, and the way he saw it was they had flown us in. To, I hadn't done a show with the band yet. I hadn't played a note with them. Did he just trust you with it? Yeah, he um, actually showed up to the video shoot. I'm already set up. I'm nervous as can be. And he walked in, and he goes, what the hell is that? And I was like, oh, no. And he's like, it's amazing, like, right away. That was oh his gosh. first thing. And I'm like, oh, God. Thank you. Yes. I'm like, I don't know if it works yet, but <laughs> it <laughs> looks really so good. good. <laughs> so we did the video first, and then, um, yeah, I... It was super weird because I was in the band and the first five things I did were like um, the video to Waste of Time, Jimmy Ki or, uh, Jimmy Fallon, like all, Ellen, like all these TV things where we just played one song. So you can't and, uh, mess up. No. And so I, That's a little bit of pressure. Yeah, but it was only one song, thank God, because I hadn't had the set programmed yet. Like in the, oh my so God. I'm carrying around this whole thing and like I only have one song in it. So, so that's kind of like that whole thing, just like... Figure it out as you go, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, don't wait till it's perfect. It's obviously perfect, but just well, start. Well, I knew it would, would, I knew in theory it would work. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah. So it was a crazy um, splash into that, but... Uh, Have I, you liked being with Keith Urban? I love it. Like, are you so... Now that you're here, are you okay with the way the journey has gone, even though there was a lot of heartbreak? Yeah, I am. I mean, <laughs> I would be the first to tell you that, I, you know... I wish it was Luna Halo headlining Madison Square Garden, but I'm perfectly okay um, being in Keith's band because I, I believe in him. Like, he literally is one of the most talented people I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, we're I think we're 65 shows into this tour, and he's still, you know, sometimes he looks at me, not that you've done something wrong, but he goes, Nay, what do you play on this song? And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> because I know he's thought of a new idea. He's like... Well, let's change it and do this, and I and I'm like, oh god, more programming. Oh now my I gotta god, go. like, more work. Yeah, yeah. So I play guitar too. I mean, yeah, and I, I play really. guitar and keyboards in the show, but um, he he is just a creative genius. Yeah, what's he like? He's incredible. He's an incredible family man. He's incredibly nice to the band and crew, from the the top guy to the lowest of the low guys that just sort of unloads the truck. He walks by and says hi. He's like just that. He's he's literally just. I, I couldn't work for a better person. He's amazing. So you guys, after this whole journey, where you are now, y'all are both married to beautiful women, amazing women. Y'all have amazing kids. They're like, what, two months apart? Which is also crazy. They're six months six. apart. Because yeah. either one of y'all were planning for kids, right? No. That's how in sync y'all are. I mean, it's almost <laughs> stupid. That's how in sync somebody is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, now y'all have, like, matching babies. You guys have these awesome careers that are both totally different but flourishing. I like to leave all my episodes with leave your light. So each one of you, give me some inspiration for just your, what you've gathered and how you'd want to inspire others based on your personal journey. I feel like for me, it's, it's just don't give up. That's yeah. like, if you believe in yourself and, and something that much, you know, and it may take five record deals, it may take four different bands, it may take you consistently reinventing yourself. Um, if you had told me, you know, 20 years ago I would be in a country band, like, I would have laughed you out of here. And, and the fact that uh, God has put every little part of my life together like that, it's incredible. Why do you think he breaks our heart along the way? To make us grow, to make us learn. The same reason we're all <laughs> with our husbands and wives and um, thank God that you know we've got our hearts broken along the way because you wouldn't be good with those other people you know so yeah I think you end up where you're supposed to be you don't give up okay so. Carrie what do you think um I mean kind of along those same lines but um you know musically speaking um if people who are you know striving to be a writer or an artist I would say challenge yourself and, and do things that are 
that don't make sense, you know, writing with people who might be in a different genre or a, um, a different age than you, and you know, because different people can come together and make something incredible. And I guess that goes with not just not just music, you know, just in general relationships or, or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, and just you know, not not to steal what he said, but just just keep hanging in there, you know, and, and uh, if you have a passion for something, no matter what it is, just keep rocking and you're gonna get told no because we got told no over and over again you gotta just pick up your your shit and keep going <laughs> keep going yeah, you know i mean you do and uh, and, and yeah god, god's got a plan for us all and it's, yeah, sometimes it sucks like it, it always pays off in the end like it does like if you stick with it but man it can be a bumpy oh ride sometimes <laughs> it may, it may curvy be, and bumpy and, yeah. and it may not be the thing you thought you know i mean when you say stick with it, it's not always, I stuck with all those bands, you know what I mean? Like, I believed in them until the very end, but it, that wasn't the plan for me, so. And the doors, doors get closed, you know, and, and, and sometimes it's, it hurts, you know, you gotta figure out what to do next. Just keep going. Okay, this is the Barlow Brothers, Nathan and Carrie. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.